turn to the book of Acts. The very beginning of it, chapter 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 11. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles, he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside him. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. <coughs> My title of this sermon, what are you looking at? And I don't think I've ever let off a sermon with a title. But today it's a pretty simple question. What are, we're all looking at stuff. We all look at all kinds of stuff every day. You can choose what to look at. You can choose what not to look at. But i got to tell you, sometimes there's some stuff that I don't care look at. I'd rather look. There's a fire service in the corner. I do that. But I'd rather look at that than look at some of the stuff that's out there to look at. We're all looking at stuff. And today's passage ends with two men, dressed in white, standing beside the people, saying, Hey guys, men of Galilee, what do you stand here and look up into the sky? What are these men of Galilee looking at? <clears throat> and why? What happened that has them in this place? Those are all great questions, and that's what we're going to look at this morning. And on our 21st century calendar, we can see that next Sunday is called Pentecost Sunday. That's the Sunday we recognize the birthday of the church. And, and we're red, by the way. That's in your bulletin. We're red for Pentecost. And so uh, we put the red banners up. And it's red day, which should be easy for us purchase line people because that's our color. Right? If, you, if you're not from purchase line, if you're from the green school, that's okay. Find something red. I, I don't have anything green to wear. But uh, sorry, Darla. Darla's back there shaking her head. <laughs> She's going to give me something green to wear next time. I need a St. Patrick's Day thing. It's got a long time to go. But it's Pen next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. The Holy Spirit was poured out of Pentecost. Power filled the people on that day, and something new was birthed. That's still alive and well and fills those who believe in Jesus. You see, the Holy Spirit was poured out upon all people after Jesus' resurrection. As Jesus was preparing to leave after his resurrection, he addresses the disciples one more time, and who records this in the book that we call the Acts of the Apostles, or just Acts. And Luke addresses this book to Theophilus, which, which could be could be some guy named Theophilus, or it could be a group of people, since the word Theophilus, look, Theophilus, say that three times fast, um, literally means God lovers, or lovers of God. Either way, Luke is writing to those who love God. And I hope that includes you, because I hope you love God. And so in his first book, the Gospel of Luke, he tells us all about what Jesus began to teach. So Luke is embarking on his second book, and he's picking up right where he left off. <clears throat> right where he left off with the first one. This is like Luke part two. Since Jesus is now risen from the dead, according to verse three, he Jesus spent 40 days showing himself to various people to convince them that he was alive. <laughs> it really should be hard for somebody, if somebody you thought was dead, and then you see them alive. There's a pretty distinct difference between dead and alive. We can generally tell. You know, you can tell uh, the difference. I hope you can tell the difference. And Jesus says to them, while they were eating, 
He says in verses 4 and 5, Don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you've heard me speak about. John baptized with water, but in a couple days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's a pretty easy thing to understand. Let's say, okay, guys, I, what he's saying here is, let's not leave. Let's wait. The water was good. But the Holy Spirit's going to be something different, something better, something, something because like this water eventually dries up, doesn't it? But the Holy Spirit never dries up. And so you all know by now that one of my favorite things to do is to try to get inside the minds of the people who heard Jesus speak, who heard the message firsthand. What were they thinking? What did it mean to them? What was going through their minds when Jesus said these things? If we were sitting there, hearing it for the first time, what would we be thinking? What's going through our minds? You see, it's easy to sit where we are and say, come on, guys, this is what he meant. So we have the benefit of hindsight. But in real time, what's going on? What if it was us? What would some of the conversations be on the side? You know, what would you, what would you look at the person behind you and say, what do you think he's talking about? I think he means this. You know, uh, and so they've been told to wait. Now, nobody likes waiting. Most, most people don't like waiting. But they're waiting in Jerusalem. They're waiting for power. And not only, not only do we not like to wait, we don't like being told to wait. It's one thing if I choose to wait. It's another thing if somebody tells me to wait. It's like, hey, wait, you just tell me what I want to know now. Don't make me wait. Don't put me in a hole. I don't like that. But somehow, it must have sounded different this time. Wait for power. John baptized with water, but the Holy Spirit's coming. This is new. And it's not something they could really even fathom. See, they, they weren't saying, I can't wait to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Then we can do this. They say, hey guys, once we get filled with the Holy Spirit, we can do this. They never, they, they, didn't know what, they didn't know what to expect. And so they met together. They met together. Go figure, they had a meeting. Hey, it's what we do whenever we don't know what's going on. We have a meeting. And the best question they could come up with, and I have no idea, would have, would have loved to have the minutes from that meeting, right? Or what they talked about. But the best question they could come up with after this meeting was, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? You can almost picture Jesus kind of being like, come on, guys. You know, I'm talking about baptism of the Holy Spirit. What does that have to do with anything? They said, wait for power, wait for the Holy Spirit. And the response shows just how confused they were. See, they're stuck, in, they're stuck in an earthly mindset. They want the earthly kingdom that involves Jesus reigning in place of King David from Jerusalem. Which would make the twelve of them leaders in the kingdom. Leading the way for government, by way of government and being leaders in different areas in Israel. It would look similar to the way it looked in the Old Testament after 1 Samuel 8 when he asked for a king and God gave him Saul. You see, having a king is all well and good as long as the king's like David. But if you get a king like Saul, you know, you know things go south. You know how it goes. And if we're going to rely on an earthly kingdom to make a difference, then, then, then we can expect disappointment. If you're waiting for the earthly rulers to get it right, and for the government to figure it out, then you're expect to be disappointed, because they're just not going to do it. This is the best they can come up with. Again, it's not because they're dumb, but they're stuck in an earthly mindset. They want to be ruling here and now. We want Everybody wants to be in charge. Everybody wants to be in control. Right? Except us. Except Jesus. Because Jesus is in control. In a way different way. So their expectations of Messiah were that he would restore the kingdom to the way it was when David reigned. After all, Jesus did talk a lot about a kingdom. Now he tells them to wait for power. And Jesus', and Jesus answer to their question is basically, none of your business. Right? He said, the times and dates set by my father, he said, the times and dates, it's not for you to know the times and dates set by the father by his own authority, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses. In this place. You see, it, it, the kind of power that we're waiting to receive is from the Holy Spirit. To do spiritual things, not earthly things, to do spiritual things on earth. Yeah, God's going to get it right. God's going to get it right. And I didn't know what he meant by that. We, you know, had we been there that day, we probably wouldn't have understood either. But listening to Jesus is always the right thing to do. And I'd like to think that if I'd have been there that day, I'd have said, guys, I'm not exactly sure what he means. But he said, "Would you see power and Holy Spirit comes?" And as painful as it sounds, I make a motion that we wait for, it, you know. And we have a second, and that's like, let's just wait. Let's just do what Jesus said, because if we don't do what Jesus says, well, that's uh, that that's not the right thing to do. 
So let's just wait. Let's just wait. And after that, Jesus said, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and to Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And as it turns out, this sentence provides the basic summary, the basic structure for the book of Acts. See, once the Gospels were named in Jerusalem, it started to spread to Judea and then to Samaria. And now we all know that the earth doesn't have ends. It's like you get to the end of the earth and you're like, oh, okay, we stop here because you ain't going for it. We all know that the earth is round, but that's not, but they're not dumb either. In those days, the ends of the earth meant the Roman world. Meant the Roman world, as far as they could go, as far as there were people. And we see that when Paul gets to Rome, when Paul gets to the Rome, Rome and the Gospels proclaimed in Rome, the book of Acts ends at chapter 28. There's not an Acts 29. Some of you may have heard me say that before. I used to wonder, why isn't there an Acts 29? Why doesn't it keep going? Why aren't we still writing Acts 20, 23? The church is still doing stuff. Events are still happening in the church. We're adding to the book. But once the gospel got to Rome, the gospel had reached the end of the earth. And the Acts of the Apostles concludes. The work of taking the gospel to the world, though, is still ongoing and will continue to be ongoing. It's just that now, now it's about now it's up to us. Because all those apostles, those 11 guys that were left and then they replaced Jews, they're all gone. Back in the, back in the first century, and again, I want to get us into their mindset. Jesus has just said all this. And in verse 9, we read, After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. So this is where we began this morning, and I asked you what you were looking at. Jesus has been taken up, and they're watching. This cloud hides him from their sight, and it doesn't stop them from looking. It wouldn't stop us from looking either. Because we want to, we want to see Jesus. Because it was, it was a lot easier if we could look and see Jesus. And verse 10 says, they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, and suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside him. And ironically enough, that should sound familiar about the two guys in white standing beside him, because in Luke 24, and remember in Luke's first book, when Jesus had risen from the dead, the women went to the tomb and found the stone rolled away. And they went in, they didn't find his body. And as they wondered what was going on, same kind of stuff's happening. They're looking for something, they're wondering what's going on, and all of a sudden, two men in clothes that gleam like lightning stood beside him and spoke to them. Hmm. Wonder if these are the same two guys. I think Luke wants us to see the similarities here. Just like he described what happened to the women at the tomb, they now describe the men of Galilee, what just happened here. These two guys and those two guys in the white clothes, man, they know what's going on. They were at the garden, they're back here. He says, guys, why are you standing there looking up into the sky? You know, that, that same Jesus, the one that was taken from you, he's going to come back. He's going to come back the same way you've seen him go into heaven. Now, there's been a lot of conjecture as to what this coming back will look like and when it will happen. There's, there's also been close to 2,000 years between this event and where we are today. And there will no doubt be more speculation as to when it will happen. But the question that was asked and needs to be asked again is why you stand there looking into the sky. And for as much as we want to see Jesus return, and for as much as it looks like he could return any day now, staring in the sky waiting for it isn't what he wants us to do. He wants us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He wants us to take the message of the gospel to the ends of the earth, whichever end of the earth you're going to. Right? We're all going different places in a couple minutes. We're all going different places tomorrow. We're all out of different places on Tuesday. Wherever it is that you go, you got to take the gospel with you. What's being communicated here isn't a blueprint for how Jesus will return. It's reassurance that he'll be back. That he'll be back. We know that. And that shouldn't be our primary concern. Should it? We know Jesus is coming back. We don't know when. We, we, we know how he's going to come on the clouds of heaven. But um, it's uh, as cool as it would be to be the first one to see it, I just want to be on board. And so, uh, so what are we looking at? You know, we're, we're looking at the beginning of a new chapter of ministry here. Well, I'm excited about that. I'm really excited about that. We're nearing the end of a process that if I could explain to you all the steps along the way in the process, I'd probably get a headache, so I'm not going to do that. Because it's, it's, been a, it's been a long couple of years trying to figure out this process. We're, we're a couple weeks away. I feel like the kids who have a couple of days of school left, we're almost there. 
And we're all most there. We're looking at a new season of being filled with power. Power to do what God is calling us to do. Power to share the gospel. We've still got to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. That is still the call and that will always be the call. And I'm excited. I'm excited because it's, uh, it's, uh, well, it's exciting. It's, it's exciting. And at the same time, if, if, if Jesus comes back next week, it'll be all right. Right? That'd be, that'd be okay. If he comes back a thousand years from now, uh, we'll see it from a different end. And so, because so, I won't be here in a thousand years. And so, uh, if you are, I'll leave you the keys. So, but let's pray. Father God, we thank you for all that you're doing. We thank you, Lord, for how you met these guys. Lord, uh, for how you sent messengers to meet these guys. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, that, um, Lord, that there's, uh, you've given us plenty to look at. We can see you. But help us to see you where we they need to show people you. Lord, for people that are looking around and looking at all kinds of stuff, Lord, there certainly is a lot to look at, but only one thing we need to see, and that's you. Fill us, Lord, with your Spirit, the Holy Spirit, Lord, that was uh, that you sent out, Lord, way back then, Lord, after you were taken into heaven. We pray, Lord, as they stood one and Lord, we stand, we still stand looking, but we're not wondering. We know you're coming. And we pray, Lord, you would be with us and help us to take your gospel, Lord, to the very, very ends, the ends of the earth in your name. Amen.